Quite often in this world of ghosts and paranormal, we use the word energies. I don't know if we use it because we're frightened of saying what something may be. Spirit, ghost, a lost loved one, something dark, something angelic and wonderful and positive. Something that's simply there designed to destroy any and everything that it comes in contact with. So many possibilities. But these energies uh, are, are picked up on by the living. Sometimes in just small bits and pieces. Sometimes in flat out traumatizing moments and waves of emotion and energy that comes over some of the most sensitive among us. How do we deal with these things? What do we do when we encounter them? Especially if they're encountered in places like our homes or our workplaces, places that we really can't necessarily easily just, well, you know, move away from. Today on the show, we hear about some dark energies and good energies, sometimes almost battling it out to take control of where the current living residents reside. Our first one, do the darkest figures that haunt a home possess the most positive of energy of all the spirits, darkest in color, including the mysterious girl down the hall? And can a single negative entity weigh down the lives of multiple people at different locations simultaneously? Those stories and more today on EPP bonus episode number 394 of Real Ghost Stories Online. My name's Tony Bruschi. Stay with us. Sometimes the most mysterious or scary or dark figures that we see or experience if we're having a paranormal experience are not necessarily the worst of what's out there. Sometimes that's just how it's presented. Sometimes that thing that looks very innocent or that you're feeling that seems kind of innocent is the most threatening. It's trying to build your trust, gain your trust to come in. What we hear in our next story is just that. Looks like a spirit of a little girl following in a distance, always kind of there for many years. But is that innocent looking child really that? Take a listen. Let me start from the beginning, because it's obviously the best place. I won't give my name, but I'm 31 from Canterbury, England. From a very young age, I would see things constantly that I couldn't explain and still can't to this day. But from listening to many paranormal podcasts, it's clear I'm not the only one who has seen these things. This is just a few of them, and I hope to put the others down to written word as well. I must have been seven years old still shared a room with my older brother, who was 10 years my senior at the time. He moved out at 17, and it all started just before he did. In our bedroom, we shared a bunk bed. Myself on the top, my brother on the bottom. It was a pretty standard bedroom, apart from the black paint that my brother somehow convinced our parents to paint the room. Two sets of Draws and one of those enormous TVs that took a couple of full-grown men to move. A 
the far cry from the slimline versions of recent years. The bedside table next to my brother's bank bunk, and finally a walk-in wardrobe built into the wall with a glass panel about three feet wide and a foot tall just above the door. It was that glass panel that started me on this journey to my haunted childhood. One night, I can't give you the time, but for those who would like to take it as witching hour, feel free to do so. It was a long time before mobile phones and the alarm clock we had was kept next to my brother's bunk on the side table, which was out of my field of vision. I woke up, looked around the room, as I usually did if I woke up in the night and everything was normal, until I laid eyes on that glass panel above the wardrobe. Pressed to the glass, I could see a face, white as snow, with what I can only describe as black, cavernous holes for eyes and mouth. It did not move, did not say a word, just stared at me with its unseeing eyes. I called to my brother, and given he was a teenager who had to share a room with his kid brother, he did not appreciate me walking with him. He just told me to shut up and go to sleep. I did as I was told, not the to sleep, but I kept my mouth shut and covered my head, hoping it would stay behind the glass and not venture out to take me. The next morning, with my brother in the room, I built up the courage to open the wardrobe door. I yanked it open, my eyes closed, and after realizing I was still alive, I opened them and looked up. There was nothing there. Not a, th not a single thing that I could see that would create the face in the black of night. But that didn't stop it from returning every night once the sun went down. I witnessed this face every night without fail for a period of time I cannot recall but which seemed like forever. Then my brother moved out. And being the only boy left in the house, my parents moved me to the smallest bedroom, which I'm sure you can understand I was ecstatic about. That was until a year or two later. Apart from my semi-unconscious brother, who I'm sure didn't pay attention, I told no one of what I saw in that bedroom or of any of the other things I've seen, those I'll mention soon enough. Fast forward a couple of years, I was nine or ten, no scary man behind the glass for me, and my own little bedroom all to myself. This bedroom was at the opposite end of the thirty or so feet landing from the bathroom, right outside the door. On the ceiling was the hatch to the loft attic room. At that age, I'm sure I wasn't the only kid scared of the dark. With that being said, I had my bed facing my door so I could see the bathroom. The landing light was on at the bedroom door wide open. Everything was going great. All until one night, I woke up, landing lights still on, door open. Only difference was the small boy hanging upside down from the loft hatch, looking straight at me. This in itself would scare most people. But then, as my eyes were fixed upon this young boy looking at me, I realized it was me. Just a younger me. Which, for some reason, was even more terrifying. It was dressed in blue denim dungarees, with a white tee and haircut the very fashionable curtain style. For those who don't know what curtains are, it's practically just a bow cut. As to be said, this look was one to have in 1996. He didn't move. He just hung there watching me intensely, unblinking, hoping the younger me would stay where he was. I jumped out of bed to shut and lock my door. That's how I slept going forward, praying that my door being locked will save me from what is out there. The landing light still on, of course. Above my bedroom door, there was another glass panel, the same as above the wardrobe in my previous bedroom, which let in enough light for me to be able to see that I was alone. Peaceful sleep, no visitors, and the night lasted for a while, but I'll get back on that later. I know he's about 11 years old as this happened, just before I started secondary school during the summer holidays. Me and my next-door neighbor were down the park, which was next to our primary school that we had just left, as well as a cemetery that was only separated from said park by a small three-foot brick wall surrounding it. We've been playing football and soccer all day. The sky was starting to turn pink, purple, and orange as it does sometimes near dusk, giving the exercise and hunger as we hadn't felt the need to run home for lunch. We were both a little frustrated. My neighbor kicked the football over the short wall into the cemetery, and I offered to go and grab it. In the cemetery, encompassed by moss, covered in rain, weathered gravestones, with a scattering of new marble plaques, I walked over the parched grass to grab the ball, 
and leaned down to pick it up. With the ball in hand, I noticed there was a girl in the cemetery with me. Standing only a few meters away, I could see the piercing green eyes, porcelain skin, tightly curled blonde hair, wearing black patent shoes, long white socks, and a red dress that bellowed out at the bottom. I saw her clear as day. She was still. Apart from her, left hand moving up to either point, wave or reach out to me. At this point, my friend called to ask if I found the ball. I turned to say I had. Upon turning back, she disappeared. The only place to hide would have been the church, but she was too far away to have reached it in time. I ran back, jumped over the wall, and said that we should start making our way home for dinner, or both our parents wouldn't be happy that we were out so late. She was very different from the others. I had seen mainly for the fact that she was the only one I had seen outside. I would see her everywhere I went. Be sitting in class, stare out the window, only to see her standing on the school field in the middle of an active football game, or in the supermarket standing at the end of the aisles. She always stayed roughly the same sort of distance away from me. But after a few years of this, she started to close the distance. At this point, it had been a couple of years since our first encounter. I was at my new girlfriend's house, a huge house, a few miles, the Whitstable Coast. I won't give her name. And her mother's, I can't remember. Her mother would refer to herself as a white witch. She was around 50 and years old and blonde hair with streaks of white and wore clothes that wouldn't be out of place at Woodstock. She was into everything from tarot, crystals, healing. There were bowls of salt in practically every window ledge at the smell of sage throughout the house. We sat around the massive ancient wooden dining table, which has strange symbols carved into it. Some, what I guess, were new. Others seemed as old as the table itself. We were in the middle of the farm-style kitchen, talking about anything and everything, when her mother shyly asked if I'd ever seen a ghost. I told her about the face in the glass, the young version of me in the loft, and she was visibly excited to hear what I had to say. Then I mentioned the girl, and her expression changed. She threw the chair back and rushed off to another room in the house. She shouted for her daughter to come and help her find something, leaving me alone in the now darkened kitchen, not having noticed the sun had gone down. They both returned after some 20 minutes, slammed the tombstone of the book on the table, frantically flipping through the pages, illustrations of animals and creatures on every page with notes to their names, as well as other writings, which from the speed of the page's movement I couldn't read quickly enough. Stopping around a third into the book, she turned it to face me and started staring back at me with a little girl who'd been following me for years. Same blonde curly hair, red dress, white skin. Her mother's words came at me thick and fast, hysterical even, asking me if this is what I have seen. I could tell from the look in her eyes that she was hoping for me to say it wasn't, but I nodded to confirm that it was and said, yes, that's the girl I've been seeing. Her mother replied to me saying, that is no girl. You are not safe. A barrage of questions and followed. How long have I been seeing her for? How many times? Does she always look the same? Where do I see her? Do I see her at home? I answered the best I could, but I know that I had not seen her at home. Her mom sent me home with sage, salt, instructions on what to do with them. I had called for my mom to come pick me up with some excuses like I wasn't feeling well and wanted to come home. Some months later, after I had turned 14, I was home alone on Friday night. My sisters without, were out with friends. My parents had gone dancing as they did every Friday. The weekend before, we had new doors put on every room in the house and relatively typical doors apart from one leading from our living room to the downstairs hallway. This had three large frosted glass panels, all about two feet tall and wide. I was happily sitting on the sofa watching TV. The door to the hallway was opposite me on the right-hand side of the room. Out of the corner of my eye... I noticed an outline of something up against the glass of the door. That's where we're going to pause the preview portion of EPP bonus episode number 394 of Real Ghost Stories Online. If you want to hear the whole thing, the entire episode, and all 394 bonus episodes that we put together exclusively for our EPP members, those are the supporters of our program, the guys that uh, help keep us on the air. Uh, 
that's what the, one of the extras that we give them. That bonus episode every single week. We'll be doing it for 394 weeks straight. Uh, and it's not going to end anytime soon. Also get access to our full archive of episodes, even everything that's already fallen off of iTunes and such. All of it's there. Thousands of episodes. The world's largest audio archive of ghost stories. Uh, my ebook and audio book. You get access to that. Uh, and and more. We're always adding new stuff there for you. Ghostpodcast.com to get in on that or patreon.com slash real ghost stories. So get the rest of this episode and everything I just talked about. You will binge away for years, quite honestly. Ghostpodcast.com or patreon.com slash real ghost stories. <laughs>